Bruce God, thank you. Uh, let me continue in English as Declan started. Uh, actually, unfortunately, probably my English will not be as perfect as Declan's, uh, but please blame my running notes, not my language proficiency for that. Uh, so, <coughs> 20 minutes to go around the world. Quite difficult task for me. I will just try to do it in 20 minutes. Um, so, if I would like to go country by country, it gives me like six seconds per country. So, this task is rather impossible. Uh, so, I will focus on major economies uh, and also on trends. On trends, what we see uh, right now uh, in economies globally and in particular uh, areas. Uh, so, as Declan already mentioned, also Michael, I think, referred to that, uh, on a global scale, we have uh, right now slowdown, slowdown which, is not, which is not a very deep slowdown, but nevertheless, we expect that this year world economy will grow by 2.9%. It's much lower, not much lower, but it's lower than recorded in 2017 in 2018. Respectively, it was 3.3 and 3.2%. So we are in the process of going weaker on the uh, economic global scale, but I think what's more important here in Austria, that here in the Eurozone, you have weaker economic uh, expansion here it is confirmed by the industrial production dynamics, because still, although we can say that uh, more and more services are contributing to, uh, to, to global economy, still industry is a significant part of that's what's happening in the Eurozone, and still it is a good proxy uh, of, of the economic activity. So, as you can see, we have finished this very long expansion period, which lasted uh, five years. Uh, starting 2018, we've seen that industrial production uh, was weaker and weaker, and then finally, at the beginning of 2019, uh, it then, uh, th then it was uh, negative dynamics of that. Uh, and that's one side of the story. The other side of this story is that uh, what we have from business sentiment. Here I provided uh, PMI indicators, so-called Purchasing Managers in the Index. Uh, this is uh, the survey that is done on a monthly basis between companies, uh, and they ask companies what's uh, the level of new orders, what's the level of employment they uh, expect they will have uh, next month, what are the inventories, as well as, as prices they will have. All in all, it comes in an aggregate result, uh, aggregate uh, indicator, and whenever it's above this Sorry, whenever it's above this uh, orange line, line uh, so above 50, it's considered to be an expansion of manufacturing. If it is below 50, it's considered to be deterioration, the slowdown. As you can see, for the most important economies in the Eurozone, including Austria, we are on this deterioration part, which is a slowdown. Uh, I think it's quite interesting, especially for Germany, so this navy line and Eurozone, so the green line, when not so long ago, uh, at the end of 2017, those indicators reached all-time high. And this survey is actually, they started like in 1996 or 1997. Uh, and after that, we see that deterioration was quite fast, and right now in Germany we have just the result of 44 points. So, weak result, and also it impacts Austria. First of all, Austria maybe was somehow um, resilient to that. As you can see, this is this uh, golden line, but finally, latest month in April, it showed that BMI indicator decreased to 49.2. So, I think it's quite obvious because Austria is not only the domestic economy, but also international economy. Uh, exports of goods and services as a percentage of GDP uh, is 55%, and it's higher than the European Union average of 46%. And actually, this European average is strongly impacted by Central and Eastern European countries, which are small countries, and they rather go on external markets if we compare the Western European average. The Western European average is even uh, smaller. 
Um, <clears throat> what's the reason for that? I think it was uh, it was uh, very it, it was uh, greatly showed by by Declan. So first of all, we have political risk, different forms of political risk. So uncertainty related with Brexit. We still do not know uh, what what will happen, how the Brexit will look like, or actually if. Uh, if Brexit will be, because that's also the scenario that, that maybe we will have the second referendum where maybe there won't be any Brexit. But still, the baseline scenario is, of course, that the Brexit will be. Uh, we have increased protectionism, uh, which, which is very correlated with uh, this so-called trade war between the US and, US and China, which is also affecting other economies, especially those uh, highly open economies. Uh, so this uncertainty, is confirmed here, and I think that this business sentiment is more pessimistic than hard data coming from industrial production because of uncertainty, because companies um, are not sure what they can expect in the future. There's one exception here, uh, as you may notice, this red line. Red line is the UK economy. So surprisingly, it seems to be an economic acceleration here because it's above 50 level on the manufacturing side. But that's just uh, at the first glance. Uh, looking in more detailed data, especially in March, we've seen increase of aggregate PMI indicator. But well, if you look, as I said, into detailed data, it was because of increasing new orders. And this increasing new orders were a result of that that we could have Brexit and no deal Brexit at the end of March. Companies there in the UK started to demand more, to, to generate more demand because they would like, they wanted to have more imported goods uh, with, uh, without any tariffs, without any customs and so on. So paradoxically, it influenced the aggregate indicator. It also influenced inventories. It also uh, resulted in higher, even higher employment. So this was kind of artificial and paradox factor, which is not sustainable and it's likely to be reversed uh, in, in next months. So <clears throat> then talking about UK, well, actually talking about Brexit, I thought when we planned this conference several months ago, I thought that when I will be here, uh, at this stage, we will, we, we, I can talk about what's the life after Brexit, but still, we do not have Brexit. Yeah? Uh, so the British referendum was in 2016, uh, and the extension of the deadline was like man, one month and, and a half ago. I remember that the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, mentioned to, uh, to British politicians, don't waste this time with the extension of the deadline. But I think I'm afraid there are not clear decisions right now at this stage. Of course, we see that Theresa May is considering maybe the, the second referendum that would like to have her own Brexit plan. But nevertheless, we do not have a clear uh, decision on that. And so far, it affects also the business sector in the UK. Uh, in 2016 and 2017, it was quite stable with business insolvencies in the UK, but then uh, this deteriorated business and consumer sentiment, uh, increased uh, inflation, uh, exchange rate, also volatility. Uh, all of those factors triggered lower demand for, uh, for, for companies, and we've experienced increased company insolvencies uh, in the UK. As you will see in a minute, we also expect they will increase this year. Um, <coughs> well. Uh, in terms of, of the UK, of course, still we have, as I said, this uh, scenario of Brexit, and the scenario is still probable of no-deal Brexit. If we have it, uh, such products like dairy products, but not only. Uh, what's very important for Austria, uh, because it's active exporter of automotive uh, production, also the transport e equipment uh, would be covered here. So if, if we have a no-deal scenario, that, that, is, that, that would be a huge concern. Uh, for businesses, uh, for, for businesses exporting uh, to the UK. Uh, so I mentioned already that uh, we expect an increase of business insolvencies uh, in the United Kingdom. We actually uh, expect that they will increase by uh, eight percent this year. You have a chart here with, with insolvencies. 
Uh, you have also our forecast for Austria, where we expect a drop by 1% of business insolvencies. But I think it's a kind of exemption, because uh, in Western Europe, uh, in Eurozone, as you can see, as you can see, we expect increase of insolvencies by 3%. And countries, especially like Germany, like France, they will, they, will, uh, um, they will record higher insolvencies, Germany by 2%. Uh, it's, uh, this trend of decreasing insolvencies in Germany uh, has stopped, and right now, as I said, it will increase, and the impact coming from external environment will be uh, very important here, because Germany uh, calls themselves as an um, export championship, Champion, export champion uh, of, of, the, of the Eurozone, and I, well, they are right, they are very active on exports, and, and the, it takes a significant part uh, of, of the GDP. Uh, so here in this chart, you can also see that um, important um, export markets like Italy, important here for Austria, we also record higher business insolvencies, plus 7%. Uh, in Italy, we have uh, so far the positive effects of um, uh, increases of household consumption supported by new social measures by the new government, but it's not sustainable. We expect that with deteriorating uh, economic activity, our forecast is for Italy is uh, the growth, GDP growth of just 0.5% this year. We are a little bit more optimistic that the latest European Commission forecast, uh, it expects it Italian economy will grow just by 0.2%. But nevertheless, also tensions with the European Union are possible here. And, and for the macroeconomic uh, economic activity in Italy, it will affect also um, the microeconomic side. And still, our permanent experiences in Italy remain not very good. Um, <coughs> so then I will not talk country by I will not discuss country by country because I'm uh, somehow running out of time. As you can see, some Exemption here uh, with uh, talking about major economies uh, comes from the US, where we still believe that the trend of decreasing insolvencies will be continued. Uh, and it seems that the US economy does not lead the global cycle for once. That you, when we talk about global slowdown, it seems at a first glance that uh, th there's, there's no uh, significant deterioration here. But I would say no significant, because last year uh, the U.S. economy expanded by 2.9%. Uh, this year we expect 2.5%, so still very good level for advanced economy. But nevertheless, uh, it's also one of the major economies that is slowing down. Um, still we have effects of positive effects of decrease of um, corporate tax from 35 to 21 percent, still some positive effects of the huge infrastructure investment plan. Mm, but I think in 2019 it looks, as I said, quite safe. Starting 2020, the U.S. will also experience more negative effects coming from increased protectionism from trade war between the U.S. and China. Uh, I'm not talking here about only retaliation measures uh, implemented uh, by China and possible other measures implemented uh, in the near future, but also uh, about uh, those increased tariffs. I think good example comes here from the steel sector. Okay, maybe it's uh, in a short term beneficial uh, for steel producers in the US, but lots of other sectors use inputs coming from the steel sector, for example, automotive sector, the construction sector, and these higher prices uh, have negative effects uh, for, for lots of U.S. businesses and therefore the economy. So closer to 2020, we will have also, according to our view, more and more uh, negative effects of, uh, of this protectionism policy. Uh, talking about uh, U.S., China, and the global economy, um, this trade war, as you mentioned in the, in the survey at the beginning, as Michael asked you the question uh, where I fully agree with you that, that you believe it's a very important factor, um, and it, it should concern Austria. Uh, our forecast for global trade dynamics uh, is 2.3% this year. So this is what you have here. 
Uh, it's much lower, it's lower than in 2017 and 2018. 2017 was quite a good year for global trade dynamics. Uh, as Declan already mentioned, German economy was expanding by 2.5%, so it's again a confirmation that if it's good on, uh, in global environment, uh, then the Germany um, is likely to, to follow that, but when it's uh, worse, uh, it, it is also um, um, a concern for, for the German economy. Uh, and here, as you can see, we expect that this increased protectionism, trade war with indirect effects not only to US and China, but also other economies, will have uh, slower effects, uh, will, will, have, uh, will result in slower dynamics of world trade. Uh, well, here, also a few words about emerging markets, because this uh, current economic slowdown, it's not a deep slowdown, because I said 2.9% growth, according to our estimate this year, but it's a slowdown of three major economies. So, slight slowdown of the US economy, but more slowdown coming from the Eurozone and from China. So, three big engines are slowing down uh, this year. And it is mostly, it should be mostly uh, attributed not only to advanced economies, not only to China, but also to other emerging markets, as you can see from this GDP growth tracker that it started already in 2018, generate lower uh, growth dynamics. And talking about emerging markets, uh, uh, let me just mention to you three main risks that we see in emerging markets. First of all, the biggest emerging economy and the biggest economy in the world, according to purchasing power standards, is China. Uh, China, well, first of all, uh, its economic growth is still very impressive, 6.2% 6 according to our forecast uh, to be reached this year, but it's much slower than it was, for example, in a previous decade when China was expanding by above 10%. The macroeconomic side is, is one thing. We've seen and we warned about it for some time that we see increasing corporate risk in China. Um, here on the right-hand side, you have result of our recent payment survey done in China. Uh, credit terms, number of days in credit terms increased uh, again. It started to increase in 2016 and we had uh, next steps of increasing um, uh, credit terms. Moreover, in terms of overdue payments, especially ultra-long overdue payments, uh, in our view, ultra-long are those which are exceeding uh, a due date of, of the invoice by more than six months. Uh, well, they increased uh, from 47% to 55%. And these are not only single invoices. Those are, um, we, we concluded just those uh, overdue payments which, are, which take uh, more than 2% of annual turnover of companies. So I would like to emphasize that this uh, risk on the corporate side is also very important and even much more important than on the macroeconomic side in China. Then another second risk in terms of emerging economies, uh, we have uh, corporate debt, especially in foreign currencies, which is quite uh, quite dangerous for uh, emerging markets. Here on the x-axis, you have the change, percentage change of how corporate debt changed between 2018 and 2019. On y-axis, you have debt to GDP ratio uh, in, the, in the middle of uh, last year. So in the countries uh, in, in uh, worst, uh, wor wor the worst case are here, Turkey, Chile, Czech Republic, Mexico, Brazil. Uh, in terms of the Czech Republic, it's a different story because most of these debts is in Euro, it's much more manageable. The Czech Republic is strongly correlated with, with the Eurozone economy. But other economies are more indebted in US dollar. We, have, we had increases of interest rates in the US, whereas lots of these countries, for example, Turkey, suffered from uh, exchange rate, uh, exchange uh, from, from the currency depreciation. So it increases costs of servicing this debt and it increases uh, the cost of financing of rolling over this debt, especially that uh, a significant part of this debt is going to mature in uh, this year and, and next year. Then the third risk, the last risk, uh, uh, and uh, I think it's important not only 
talking about emerging markets, although we have some countries that are oil producers, others uh, that are oil importers, but it's also very important on the global scale, it's what's happening with oil prices. Please take a look. Uh, Navy Line is Brent oil price per barrel. Starting this year, it increased in the first quarter and increased roughly by 30%. Right now, the price is uh, roughly the same like I mentioned here. I checked this morning, so it's a little bit lower than $72 per Brent barrel. As you can see, this increase was significant. It was good for countries producing, uh, producing oil, but others suffer from that. It was the result of OPEC deal, OPEC plus countries deal, that decided to, uh, to, to, cut, uh, to cut the oil production. Uh, you have more data here, I will not discuss it. Uh, and the question right now is that what's, what's next? Of course, we still have um, factors that are still affecting the oil market, so sanctions on Iran, Venezuela, but we have, I think, two important factors that will uh, affect uh, oil market in the near future. So the trade tensions and that are likely to bring oil prices down, whereas the opposite direction is there are recent attacks on oil infrastructure in Middle East, which are likely to happen again, and that will trigger prices to, to, to go up. Uh, and last but not least, or even the, the most important, uh, I think that uh, this output deal will not survive in the second half of this year, that uh, there will be change of, of view of OPEC plus countries. They are going to meet here in Vienna next month at the end of June. And I think that's uh, the message coming from them is the one that should be uh, monitored uh, and that will give us more hint what, what we should expect in the second quarter of uh, 2019. And then, last but not least, I left it as the icing on the cake, uh, Austria. Uh, so in terms of GDP growth uh, in Austria, last year we had, for the advanced economy, very good rate of 2.7%. Uh, you can see that on this chart, this orange line. Here, these color bars are contributions coming. So what, what was the result of, uh, what were the components of this GDP growth? And you can see in 2018, we had a very balanced uh, GDP growth in Austria. Um, contributed by household consumption, thanks to good situation on the labor market, lower unemployment rate, growing wages, also family bonus plus uh, program that was introduced. Um, and investments, this part, as well as red parts, so net exports. Net exports is a difference between exports and imports. Like now, in 2019, we expect 1.5% growth here in Austria. Uh, and, uh, well, you cannot see the red part because it disappears because of this situation on export markets. Of course, according to our view, exports will be positive, but they will also be consumed by the similar uh, dynamics of imports, and uh, this situation like we had in 2018 will uh, not be uh, repeated. Of course, uh, in Austria, on the domestic side, we have challenges like, for example, labor shortages. You also mentioned that uh, in the survey we have at the beginning. Um, uh, job vacancies are one of the highest in the European Union in Austria, just next to Germany, Czech Republic and, and, and Belgium. Uh, but as a last point, uh, I said already that the economic openness of Austrian economy is high. And I used here ec the economic complexity index. It's the index that measures a knowledge intensity of the particular economy. The higher the index, the more country is integrated in so-called global supply chains, global value chains, and with high economic openness, it's more affected by any trade disruptions like we have right now. And as you can see globally, Austria ranks here 10th position. Uh, globally, it's not like for, for some group countries, but it's globally. So indeed, those effects, if we have slower growth uh, globally, if we have some concerns about uh, trade growth, that will definitely also affect um, Austrian economy. Luckily, you still have this part of domestic uh, demand that, that is quite stable. And last but not least, I know I have to finish. Uh, <coughs> just uh, 
towards on our, uh, our, our risk assessments. Uh, maybe you're familiar with that. We look at corporate risk and uh, I encourage you to, to visit our website if you are more interested in, in particular countries because we have country notes there. In Austrian assessment remains at a one level, also the German one is at, at one level. In Western Europe we have only countries like the UK which is A3, Italy is A4 and we have also sector risk assessments, not significant changes last month, but previously at the beginning of year, we decreased the assessment, we downgraded the automotive sector in Western and Central and Eastern Europe. So, um, concluding, not as good times as there were in 2017 and 18. more risks in our view on external side, but it does not mean that domestic side is uh, free of, of any risk. Sorry to be too long to go behind the schedule, but anyway, I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Thank for you. your speech. Please stay here, stay here. Because we, we have three questions, please, short answers. Mm -hmm. I will okay, short. Really <laughs> short, because we want to, to make all of three if you mm -hmm. have okay. long answers. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, a special <coughs> one, why is Denmark facing increased in insolvencies? Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of Denmark, uh, I would say that w there's a very low base of insolvencies. So uh, we have, I don't remember the exact name, but there are like a few hundreds of insolvencies. And whenever we have any change of insolvencies, it impacts overall statistics. And right now, as far as I remember, they also cleaned registers from inactive companies in Denmark. So I, I wouldn't base so much on that. It's not that the the, the business sentiment is strongly uh, deteriorating here of the business liquidity. Second question, world trade between 2010 and 15? Mm -hmm. uh, 2010? 10 and, and 15. Uh, you mean wh what's what was the what were dynamics here or maybe maybe it's only the uh -huh. question as a as a I don't know if you can come back. Uh, well <coughs> uh, I don't remember the exact figure. Or maybe we can do this question in, uh, in between. Uh, maybe somebody uh, who uh, made this question, please uh, c come to me and then we make it, mm -hmm. make it uh, we, together. We have the deterioration in 2019. Uh, uh, starting 2010, it, it rebounded. Uh, mm -hmm. But to tell you the truth, I don't remember the exact figures. I think it was, it was uh, the average was higher than we have for the last three years. And the last one, do we need to prepare for a European recession? Well, I think that's a good question to <laughs> Mr. Miller. <laughs> that's a good to pass the stage to him. But <clears throat> I think uh, everything depends on the magnitude of that what's coming from uh, uh, from these trade tensions, trade war. Yeah, let's let's use this word, trade war. There are not trade tensions. This is trade war between the U.S. and China and the magnitude uh, on on uh, on the European economies. I think that domestic side right now is uh, is doing quite well. And it is the factor that uh, somehow outperforms. It will not compensate the, the, this deterioration, but, but will not also. Y you know, as a journalist, a a it, it is a yes or no. What do you think more? I think that we will not have a recession in the Eurozone. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you now you. for your thank speech. You. Thank you, Mr. Sijevich.